coming from to the question of moral panics from kind of a slightly left field perspective. In a way, moral panics is at the centre of my work, but in another way, I've not chosen to call it moral panics, which is quite interesting. Because I think, in a way, for me, and we can talk about this in the question, there's some limits with thinking in terms of moral panics. Um, but I am really picking up from where Frank finished in terms of where morality comes from, whose morality, questions of who has value and why, and questions of the kind of elite and elite motivations. I'm going to read this paper because it's pretty dense, but what I'm going to do is try and think with a case study out of my book, which is a case study of the eviction, what well, begins with the eviction of travellers from Dale Farm. In his account of the processes of neoliberal disenfranchisement, Loic Waquan outlines what he describes as three major forms of symbolic and material dispossession, which he argues have constituted new forms of poverty within neoliberal states. Labour precariousness, which affects, he argues, material deprivation, family hardship, temporal uncertainty and personal anxiety. The relegation of people to decomposing neighbourhoods in which public and private resources are dwindling and heightened stigmatisation in daily life as well as in public discourse. Writing from kind of US perspective, Henry Giroux similarly describes the major characteristics of neoliberal political governance as what he terms a biopolitics of disposability, in which poor minorities of colour and class, unable to contribute to the prevailing consumerist ethic, are vanishing into sinkholes of poverty in desolate and ab abandoned enclaves of decaying cities, neighbourhoods and rural spaces, <coughs> or he says in an ever-expanding prison empire. While Bauman argues that neoliberal states are characterised by the creation of what he terms wasted humans within and at the borders of sovereign territories. So in my book, I began to think through these kind of theoretical provocations about the state we're in through a focus on four populations in Britain who are being laid to waste by neoliberal governmentality. And I focus on unwanted, irregular migrants, and in particular on immigration detention, on young, unemployed people at the sharp end of political and economic um, policies, disenfranchised, but also policed, and moves there to work fair, and the kind of moral, new moral value of work. Gypsies and travellers, and people living with disabilities. And as I document through these case studies, neoliberal governmentality is not characterised by laissez-faire market economics, but demands actually extremely aggressive, continuous and repressive interventions by the state and a variety of state actors. Um, and Elizabeth Puvinelli puts it like this, any form of life that is not organised on the basis of market values is characterised as potential security risk to be ferreted out and strangled. So this is the kind of context which Revolting Subjects addresses as it tends to elaborate a thick account of neoliberal Britain from the bottom up, from the bodies and spaces of inequality and injustice, but also from the sites of resistance and revolt which neoliberal governance gives rise to. <clears throat> chapter of the book I want to speak about this morning begins with the eviction of the Irish traveller site Dale Farm in Essex in 2011, a site that's currently being re-evicted. This case study is about a population, Irish travellers, whose long-standing marginality might seem a long way from the lives of most of us gathered in this room. 
But I want to argue, thinking with Dale Farm, that the, tra the treatment of the travellers at Dale Farm illustrates precisely some of the key characteristics, questions, contradictions, paradoxes of neoliberal governmentality which we urgently need to think. Specifically, the relationship between symbolic and material forms of violence, the ways in which moral panic manufactures consent for inequalities and injustice, and the ways in which neoliberal governmentality operates through the production of stigma. And also, the ways in which politics itself is culturalised and capitalised on in kind of novel and inventive ways. And, you know, these slides, this here is an advertising image for Big Fat Gypsy Weddings, and so I'm kind of trying to bring together, if you like, the cultural domain of what we might call a capitalisation of these marginalised subjects here by a reality TV production company, I'm going to get to at the end, but also how that connects with, you know, these very violent material sort of forms of policing that are going on. So let's begin on the 19th of October 2011, Dale Farm in Essex. An estimated 150 riot police converged on the largest gypsy and traveller site in Europe to enable Basildon Bar Borough Council and the notorious bailiff company Constant & Co to carry out what is the largest forced eviction of British citizens from their homes in living memory. <coughs> Around 500 people, of whom approximately 100 were children, had been targeted for eviction from a six acre plot of land owned by the Irish traveller families. While one half of the Dale Farm site had been a traveller site since the 1960s and had the necessary planning permission for the establishment of dwellings, the second half of the site, developed on a former scrapyard, can contravene local planning laws and was deemed illegal. And so the Essex police, in full riot gear, employed taser guns, a battering ram, iron bars, and batons, sledgehammers and shields, to enter the site, which had been barricaded by travellers and a significant number of activist allies. I'm just going to play you a clip. <coughs> unfolded over the next 48 hours, broadcast live on rolling news channels, the unruffled speeches of Tony Ball, the leader of Basildon Borough Council, to the gathered international news media, jarred with television footage of trampled fences and burning caravans. After the eviction, Gypsy Council representative Joe Cowley noted, there is a feeling that after Dale Farm, nothing will ever be the same again. There is terror in the community. And I think this eviction at Dale Farm was one of the most disturbing and corrosive events in the history of British race relations, the consequences of which are still unfolding. <coughs> then it's important to remember that in the case of Dale Farm no criminal laws have been breached by the travellers. Despite the presence of riot police this was a civil planning dispute. Dale Farm is owned by traveller families 
One half of Dale Farm site, designated a brownfield site, have been habited since the 60s. The travellers on the so-called illegal half of the site had applied for retrospective planning permission, but had been refused several times over the previous decade. On the grounds of the alleged harm that, they, that may be caused to the green belt by the presence of their mobile homes. And this image, as we'll see in a minute, is kind of typical of the kind of media visual representation of Dale Farm. I wonder if it's possible to turn the lights off at the front. Because the images are quite important here. So the council is contending that approximately half of the travellers have contravened planning laws by establishing caravans, chalets and mobile homes on land that they legally owned but is designated as Greenbelt but had actually been, in actual fact, used as a scrapyard. So you can see here, this is the unauthorised site. And again, these kind of aerial perspectives are central to the kind of media presentation of this dispute. In actual fact, this unauthorised site built on the scrapyard had actually been established partly by the council themselves, who'd actually laid down the hardcore on concrete. So this photograph here shows the green, so-called Greenbelt land that the uh, illegal site has been made on, which is actually this car scrapyard that had been hardcored by the council historically. Um, many Dale Farm residents had arrived at this site in the previous decade as a consequence of failed planning applications and resulting enforcement actions and evictions against them elsewhere in the south of England. And in particular, these are some of the evictions that have led to this enlargement of Dale Farm. Uh, wood, woodside, Meadowlands, Twin Oaks, um, some of which have been filmed. The, the kind of violence of these evictions by this bailiff company, Constant & Co, has been filmed. Several international human rights covenants to which Britain is a signatory set out the requirements of states to abstain from and protect against the forced eviction of people from their homes and lands. And actually as a consequence of Dale Farm, um, you know, there was international representation at the site to try and stop the British government and the council from enabling this eviction to take place. Sorry, the slides are cut off. Um, but these are the kind of international laws that lawyers are trying to argue for to stop the eviction of this site. But over a decade, the council received the permission finally through the British courts to go ahead with the forced eviction. And the manner in which they carried it out continues to be contested in relationship to international law. At Dale Farm, people lost homes and access to land in which they invested a considerable amount of time, labour and income. They'll receive no compensation. And on the contrary, the council is attempting to claim the land owned by the evictees to offset the costs of the eviction. It's estimated the council has spent £4.3 million in this eviction of approximately 500 people from this six acre plot of land. And in March um, 2013, travellers were sent the first bill of 4.3 million for their eviction so far. So we're talking thousands of pounds per woman, man and child evicted. David Cameron had personally intervened to ensure that Basildon had access to any additional funding they were required to proceed with the action. The British government had committed so 5 million from the Home Office and 1.2 million from the Department of Communities and Local Government towards the cost. Of course, the cost to the residents, including the loss of networks and friendship and care and protection built up over decades, but also loss of access to stable education and established welfare support systems. 
So you get these kind of incredible contradictions where on the one hand there's a specialist travellers school, this is the first generation actually of Irish travellers in Britain to have access to a stable and specialist education, there are community activities funded by the council on the site, all the residents on the site are paying their council tax and at the same time you get this incredibly violent eviction taking place. And the double standards of Basildon Council's actions are made manifest, I think, and at the same time as its ongoing campaign of terror was being conducted against this community, it granted planning permission for the building of a dog's home and two houses on Greenbelt land within a mile of the Dale Farm community. While in February 2012, it set out plans for the development of 850 new homes on a wildlife haven in an area of Basildon called Dry Street. So also this planning application system itself is exposed to be immoral. Further, this former scrapyard that's contested here, that's been evicted, is not situated as suggested by the council and by much of the news media in an area of environmental significance, but actually it lies very close to the A127, a busy arterial road into London. The site is a short distance from a large retail park. So these are the views. This is the view in the Daily Mail of Del Farm, this is Del Farm here, which positions it in a kind of the green and pleasant land of England that's being defiled by the traveller site. And this is the illegal half of the site here. And this is a perspective that you don't see in the media of Dale Farm. This is Dale Farm here. This is the illegal part. This is a massive Tesco's. And this is a massive uh, regeneration area for businesses uh, supported by Basildon Council. So literally what you see and how the perspective and what you see is shaping uh, public opinion here on the travellers and attaching uh, sort of meanings to the illegal inhabitants of this land. And this is an aerial photograph of Dale Farm after the eviction and this is the evicted part of the site and what the travellers have actually done is move into the road which is a private road next to the site where most of them are still living um, many without water or proper facilities. The majority of gypsies and travellers in Britain define themselves as English or Romany gypsies with Irish travellers, Welsh gypsies, Scottish travellers, showmen and circus people and New Age travellers compromising smaller, often culturally distinct ethnic groups. Most Irish travellers live in Ireland, but there have been Irish traveller communities in the United States and in Germany and, and in Britain since the mid-19th century. It's not actually known exactly how many people self-define as gypsies or travellers, but estimates in Britain um, made by the gypsy and traveller communities themselves suggest a population of around 300,000 people. This figure includes those who live now in bricks and mortar housing and only a very small number of Britain's gypsies and travellers continue to maintain any kind of traditional way of life such as living together like they do in Dale Farm in extended family networks on communal pitches and or travelling in the spring or summer. So the scale as John Grayson says here of the gypsy problem is a remarkably modest one. Gypsy and traveller families with a travelling way of life amount to less than 4,000 caravans on unauthorised sites in the whole of England, with a, a further 13,000 on council and private pitches. Since gypsies and travellers were barred from camping on remaining common land uh, in England, a ban which was cemented in law in the 1857 Enclosures Act, 
and has been followed by numerous immobilising laws and policies, the nomadic, anti-proletarian, -pro autonomous culture of the gypsies and travellers has become increasingly precarious. At the same time, industrialisation, urbanisation, the mechanisation of agriculture has radically destabilised access tr to traditional forms of income, including farm labour uh, in particular. Enclosure, surveillance and policing intensified with the Caravan Sites Act in, in 1960. So there's this history, if we trace it back, very long history of enclosure, which has had an immobilising effect on this community. And at the moment, local authorities spend, putting Dale site, uh, farm aside, around 18 million a year, evicting the small remaining number of caravanning communities from unauthorised sites rather than allowing planning applications to succeed. So what, what travellers were told to do is to buy their own land when the common land was enclosed. They bought their own land. When they pitch up on their own land, they are evicted, even if they own the land, which is what's happening here at Dale Farm. So what they try and do is set up camp and apply for retrospective planning permission because that, that they're more likely to succeed that way. But 90% of their planning applications to live on land, even that they own, is turned down because of the xenophobic campaigning very often by settled communities in local areas. And of course it's a huge amount of political capital each time for local councillors and politicians to campaign against these planning applications. All the research that's been done shows that gypsies and travellers today are actually the most ostracised, hated and feared ethnic minority population in Britain, subject to daily racism, including violent attacks and threats. So, for example, a Children's Society report details that 9 out of 10 gypsy and traveller children have suffered racial abuse with 63% reporting intensive bullying and physical attacks. Okay. So what I want to do is think about how Delft, why is consent, in fact, you know, why is the well, why was the eviction of Delft Farm not only consented to by the wider British public? but also kind of celebrated, it became a spectacle on 24-hour rolling news. What's the history of this consent? We know that xenophobic hate speech against gypsies and travellers encouraged by local and national newspapers with journalists regularly engaging anti-gypsy and traveller campaigns such as this Sun campaign which began in 2005, Stamp on the Camp in the run-up to the May general election in the UK. Um, the headline, Sun War on Gypsy Free for All, encouraged readers in this issue to contribute stories about the misery it claimed was inflicted by traveller communities and included a cut-out petition for readers to sign and send to Downing Street <coughs> to stop what it termed the illegal camp madness. And the Sun's campaign is focused almost entirely on Dale Farm. So in 2005, it's still Dale Farm, employing the now familiar aerial shots of the site, captioned here by the title, Spreading Misery. The Stamp on the Camps campaign was launched the same month as a seven-point plan by Michael Howard, then leader of the Conservative Party, in opposition, detailing how the Conservatives plan to curb the illegal gypsy and traveller encampments. And on the 21st of March, Howard visited Craze Hill, the village next to Dale Farm, during what he termed as proud to be British pre-election tour and spoke with local residents who live near the site. He didn't visit or speak to any Dale Farm residents themselves, <coughs> although he was photographed gazing at the camp through the eight-foot spike fence at the bottom of one resident's garden. And this was the uh, election 
the, the six point peer plan that he announced on this uh, pre election campaign tour uh, targeting uh, gypsy and traveller uh, encampments. To publicise this new policy framework, Howard took out a series of full page advertising spots in national newspapers titled I Believe in Fair Play with the strap line of the Conservative election campaign, are you thinking what we're thinking? The Conservative Party lost the 2005 general election, but within eight months of the 2010 general election, the forced eviction of Dale Farm would be carried out under the rubric of the big society ideology and in full gaze of the British public and international media. So my argument here is public consent for the Dale Farm eviction was incited and orchestrated within Conservative Party political rhetoric and latterly policies in concert with the mediating agencies of the tabloid press over several years. In particular, this forced eviction needs to be understood, I think, in the context of broader neoliberal processes of statification and especially the institution of ideologies of the big society, technologies of localism, such as the 2011 Localism Act, which promised to affect the decentralisation of central government powers by shifting powers and deepening democracy within local government and communities that they serve. The huge amounts of public funds committed by local and national government to manage the traveller problem appears, I think, on the surface of it, to be anathema to the logic of neoliberal economics, understood as a kind of form of governance concerned with the removal of impediments to free market. And, of course, this involves, under this current coalition government, the radical relaxation planning laws, interestingly. Yet this population of failed citizens present, I would argue, both a challenge and an opportunity for neoliberal forms of governmentality and cultural enterprise. Firstly, so this is kind of some of the broader arguments of the book, abject populations, these failed citizens, are capitalised upon by politicians in order to garner public consent for governmental strategies and to create votes. So the first thing to say is there's a lot of political capital to be gained. So, you know, why spend this huge amount of money evicting this tiny group of people from a former scrapyard? Well, there's a huge amount of political capital. The generation of a kind of disgust consensus around a population like this enables this group to be transformed into a political capital uh, which Linton Crosby, the Conservative Party strategist, describes as dog whistle issues which will bring voters to heel. Secondly, their status as what I call national abjects also presents opportunities for business enterprise such as the penetration of international global securities companies into the state, in the case, for example, of asylum seekers and migrant illegality, the sale of newspapers, the generation of work for local, here, local and national bailiff companies, engaged in these endless cycles of eviction. Most remarkable, though, in the case of gypsies and travellers, is the way in which their abject status and its sensational uh, value has been capitalised upon within the global entertainment industry. Since 2010, the lives of gypsies and travellers, once almost invisible within mainstream media culture, apart from this kind of routine demonisation in local newspapers and tabloid newspapers, have become luridly spectacularised on reality TV through the hit BAFTA-nominated series Big Fat Gypsy Weddings. This is one of Channel 4's highest rating programmes of all time. Viewing figures peaked at 9.7 million for the screening of the second episode of Series 1 in 2010. 
when the head of the production company that made the show said gypsy mania is sweeping across Britain. Contemporary reality TV series such as Big Fat Gypsy Weddings are made almost exclusively by independent production companies and are motivated by profit. So sale revenues um, are at least £3.5 million um, and it's been franchised in 81 countries, this programme including Africa, Central Europe and Latin America. And as is customary with documentary film and television programmes, none of the participants is paid their free labour, adding considerably to the profit margins to be made. So there was episodes of Big Fat Gypsy Wedding that were filmed at Dale Farm, um, so they're very closely, literally connected. At the moment, there's a franchise spin-off called My Big Fat American Gypsy Wedding um, on the US-based Discovery Channel network that's just cu is currently being broadcast. So Channel 4 claim this programme is about celebrating difference and challenging prejudice. But the Irish traveller community has argued that they're being exploited and misrepresented. Moreover, as traveller activists and spokespeople have detailed, the programme's depiction of traveller culture has played a central role in legitimating the current groundswell of overt discrimination, prejudice and racial hatred towards Irish traveller and other gypsy and traveller communities. And this is quote here is Brian Foster, uh, who's chairman of the advisory group um, for the education of travellers, who notes, Big Fat Gypsy has joined Pikey as an acceptable form of address in some schools, and girls have been subjected to sexual harassment by boys emulating the dubious practice of grabbing sensationalised by the programme. One Irish traveller named Margaret has talked about how the programme has been great for 9 million viewers, but has created, created incredible suffering within the traveller community. It has put us back 20 years. We fought years and years to get where we were, but thanks to the racial abuse that's been going on since the first series was aired, the young girls are terrified. And, you know, travellers have talked a lot about having to leave school and having to hide or conceal their identity as a consequence of the, when every time the programme is screened, this, the screen is kind of backlashes that happen. Yeah, just finishing now. So in conclusion then, I would say that the history of the subjugation of gypsies and travellers in Britain is a kind of tragedy of the commons. It's about the enclosure of land and property and this kind of history of stigma, but it's also about the specificity, I think, of kind of neoliberal social and economic policies and the way that which they in particular operate through new forms of classification and stigmatization. Um, so I'm going to finish there, kind of run out of time, but my, my attempt is really to try and think these seemingly different spheres of kind of stigma television, reality TV, and kind of the actual symbolic and material violence together, because I think they're part of the same landscape of stigmatisation that kind of defines contemporary Britain and government through stigmatisation. <laughs>